Uh, so today, fortunately, I'm here with Edie Fake. I'm Caroline Bakita. I do Peggy Press, which is a queer feminist, total art freaker publishing adventure. And um, I have been fortunate in my life, professionally and, uh, you know, in the non-professional life, to be friends in uh, cohorts with Edie Fake, um, who is... I have to just say, preface, that I am totally biased. So if you're looking for a cutthroat interview that's really digging into the ED and just all the hard questions in a, in a brutal way, you're not going to find that here. Um, I'm really used to like spending a lot of time with the ED, um, getting pretty far out there, like as in, you know, we, we time travel in our conversations. Um, He's, I've stayed with him out in the desert. He stayed with me in the city. We, so this might, this will definitely be a little bit more conversational in that form. So, that being said, um, hi. 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 Hey. What a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much to look at us. Oh, yeah. And if you weren't aware of this, Edie is a guest of honor this year's Mocha, which is. Uh, and for a really good reason. I mean, Edie has over the years um, has just like a laundry list of accomplishments, I would say. Like, I, I kind of felt like a proud mom, like reading over. Like, I thought, oh, I know you so well. We're like really good friends. But then when you do the, like the deeper dive into researching your friends and you're like, oh my God, is I can't believe this. Like, just kind of like, I mean, I knew there's certain things I know about being one of the first recipients of the Printed Matter Awards uh, for artists that they started doing around 2000, I think that was 2008. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, to the receiving the Ignatz Award in 2011 for Gaylord Phoenix, um, to the re most recently with the cover of the Paris Review and highlighting a lot of his work in it. Um, I just don't even know. <laughs> There's too much. There's too much. Oh, and showing in Marlboro and with Western Edition. So not only does E.D. had like a very long uh, history within like the indie comics world and producing small editions and then also working with people like Secret Acres or myself through larger editions, um, also has this whole other life as like a fine artist showing in museums or having solo shows at Marlboro, Western Editions, um, being including most recently at the Museum of Arts and Design and the uh, pattern and decorative uh, surface depth. Surface yeah. depth of, uh, about Miriam Shapiro and the legacy of the, that movement and how it's influenced uh, artists that are still alive. Um, to being included in the first show of the VCU's new Art Institute, yeah, their museum. Totally. A show in Syracuse. Show in Syracuse. Yeah. So, so you know, you start researching your friends, and you're like, I am so proud of my friends, you know? So, Edie, um, I'm just going to give a little background first, and then we can jump into the different bodies of work, which, to for simplifications, uh, how much time we have. Um, really, we're just going to cover like some major projects like the Memory Palaces, uh, Gaylor Phoenix, Little Stranger, and uh, I think that was it. So like three, oh, and like the larger body of fine, fine art of the paintings. Um, so that's just going to be kind of like a broad overview of how at least the slides are going to go. And conversationally, it might really diverge from that. So, I mean, you know, you can try to, you know, oh, we're just going to go through the slides and talk about every single one. We'll wiggle around. Yeah, we're going to wiggle around. We yeah. like wiggling it as uh, Evie says, squirreling around. Squirreling. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, Evie? This is, this is me in my natural habitat with my natural habitat support animal. <laughs> Kiwi. Kiwi. Uh, you grew up in Evanston, Illinois. I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, yeah. Okay. Um, 
And I've lived in Chicago for some periods of time that have really influenced my work like a whole, whole lot. Um, but now I live out in the desert in California, which is great for me both in terms of like time and space to do work and to um, be good to my friends and also um, climate wise, it, it feels great. It's very warm and I'm sort of a reptile. So. Yes, <laughs> I think after all the years in Chicago, you deserve some sun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but after, let's well, say, you went to RISD. I did, yeah. And after that, you kind of, similarly to myself, we have we have very a lot of parallels, but just didn't live in the same cities at the same time. But yeah. you were in New York, in San Francisco, Baltimore. I did. I mean, I feel like I was really nomadic for a long time. Um, directly after RISD, I think even like, uh, I lived in Chicago, moved to New York, moved to LA, moved to San Francisco, lived on a bus. Oh yeah. I um, landed this bus. It was a beautiful bus. Yeah. Landed in Baltimore, went on tour. The Finger Store? Finger Store. Yeah, that was a good tour. Broke down outside of St. Louis. The bus got dragged to some freaky gay land in Tennessee. Yes, I know. And I dragged myself back to Chicago for a few years. And then from there, I moved to LA, now I'm out in the desert from there. Um, which, uh, yeah, I'm lucky enough now that I, I, when I got the bee in my bonnet, I was like, oh, I could live anywhere. Like, I'll live um, the desert out. Out there is a place I've visited for like a decade and a half, and then I got the bee in my bonnet. And I was like, I know I could live in one of my favorite places. I can work from yeah. anywhere. Like, well, yeah. I think sometimes I've encountered this a lot from my own world, where people are like, "How do you know so many people, or how do your products happen?" And it's from having lived and traveled around a lot that you make all these connections. I think also from working at Quimby's. Yeah, for quite some time. There's a lot of like cross pollination. I think is like the term I like to right. use for it because like uh, like especially in person cross pollination, which it is it's something that keeps me interested in things like comics festivals, where you get to like if you are making work, you can trade or exchange work with other people who are doing stuff. Um, I feel like that's just like huge in terms of like um, I don't know a network. I still rely on today, which I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm lightly touching the internet, but I'm not, deep, right. I'm not deep in the digital hole, which yeah. is a powerful tool, but I can vouch for like the power of like an in-person network. Yeah, I think we're still within a generation that understands about like sending mail and pen pals and, you know, it's like a free internet life. You're like, I don't know, we traveled around and I didn't have a cell phone and you just had a paper map, which some people in the audience that might resonate with and some people are like, I don't know, but what do you mean by that? Um, but I think, I mean, that's how we met was, uh, well, probably when I lived in Providence. I'm not sure I'd always heard about you, because you're right back at it. Yeah. yeah. Um, but then our friendship grew throughout the years uh, through art, and you were one of the founding members of the organizational team for CAKE, the uh, Chicago Alternative Comics Expo. Yeah. And I I feel like that's when we, or, well, it was like, those were some of, like, for me, I'm like, that's, I think, when we started getting closer. I think you yeah. were doing something for the first publication that Pepper, Pepper Corn Press ever did, but that was before, when did Cake start in 2011? Um, Cake took a while to get off the ground, so I think the first one was maybe 2011. Yeah, I think it was, yeah, I had actually future sense there at that, I'm pretty sure. But, um, yeah, so just highlighting though, like about how it was, yeah, our spheres were very much like interacting with each other. Yeah, and it feels like, I mean, like that's another thing too of like, uh, depending on where you're, you live, like finding like a scene that you're part of, and then also like that kind of colliding with other other scenes. Like I'm pretty sure we met while I was visiting Providence at some yes. point in time. Yeah. But you know, like our friendship kind of strengthened through multiple or orbits, and like that was something about working on putting 
together at Comics Festival in Chicago, which is a town that has a tremendous comic scene. But yes. at the time, the very serious one. it was super insular as well. Like a lot of work was being made in town that wasn't getting out of town. And I feel like like putting together a comics festival was a good way to start like seeing those tendrils kind of reach out more than they have been in this way. Which, uh, yeah, I don't know if that's just the exciting thing about that project, I think. Yeah. Uh, I'm not organized enough to keep organizing it, but. <laughs> well, I think also the way that we really connected was through both identifying as queer and uh, both doing work that has touches on sexuality in different ways or being open to that. And I know that, like, you know, uh, I read a quote where you're saying that you're fighting for a gay utopia which I totally, I feel like in the work that I've tried to put out into the world is similar where I just want total sexual freedom. Well, I want freedom for everyone, but particularly like there to be sexual freedom for everyone, um, which is like, would be for me the base of like most problems is sexual repression. But to be very simplistic about worldwide problems. Um, but I know, I feel like we've really connected in that way because at the time, maybe even like a decade ago or so, in a lot of uh, fests that were happening and whatnot, there wasn't a lot of representation of queer, transgender, any POC folks, and it's slowly been evolving over the decade. But yeah, in the very, I would say it was like there was definitely some fests that were happening where I'm like, I am technically the only queer publisher here. Yeah, which is actually annoying because I know that there's a lot of other queer artists that are not being represented in a sphere. What am I doing in this beefy world? Basically, yeah. yeah. Um, and then I found um, through like the print and matter scene, which was way more, uh, I think maybe art books traditionally, there is more queerness happening with them within them, or at least under the direction of the fairs before. Yeah, yeah, and I think, I mean, it's also something of being part of, like, trading scenes with people, mm -hmm. or, and, and, like, being part of that culture, like, um, I think it's, it, it's this problem that has been part of the comic scene, and I think it, it, it is changing, but it still feels so slow. <laughs> yeah, well, I know, like, um, for Kate, that year that you all had me come and I facilitated a conversation with Phoebe Glockner, Heather Benjamin, and um, uh, Julia. Yeah, Julia Refer, and um, it was sex, death, and anxiety. That's and, one of the best comments <laughs> yeah. I've seen. And it was really interesting because you know all their work does. I mean, the people's interpretations of those three women's work is so like. And people are like, are you sexually traumatized? Like anything about sex, if a uh, femme-identified person is doing anything about sex, you're like trauma, trauma, or you're totally a whore, or something. You know, it's like very, you know, and especially reading all these interviews with that people have had with those three women over time, I was just like, oh my god, this interpretation of this work is so intense, and some of it is, yeah. yes, but like. Um, I feel like there's also, I mean, there's such a liberation sense in it too, though, and like a, I don't know, it's, there's a, there's a wildness there as well that I think you got in the conversation. Well, it's, you know, experiences that people are experiencing but are not being turned into graphically, you know, like as in a graphic novel or comics, illustration, etc. There's a lot of like, um, I feel like there's plenty of representation of male identified about anxiety and yeah. love, you know, like a need for love, et cetera. And sometimes, I mean, I, I, I'm finding in the past decade that there's more openness to get into like the deeper nuances of the human experience, which I think with Gaylord Phoenix um, and going on that journey of which is, can be a very metaphysical journey of the body, of emotions, as identifying as queer, as trans, as non-binary. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, ooh, let's fast forward to oh, yeah. the Gaylord slide. Yeah, oh, sorry, this is the disclosure that we're very good friends, obviously. <laughs> this is us hanging out. Uh, yes. Um, I feel like it was a big, I mean, my work isn't necessarily about representation in the form of 
auto bio, mm -hmm. but it is in terms of getting at some kind of queer and trans experience of being like a sex, explicitly being a sexual body in the world. Um, and so I think it started with this series Gaylord Phoenix that was about, it's about this bird man who, um, whose sexuality and emotions transform uh, throughout, the, throughout the series and continue to kind of um, keep evolving as he goes on these kind of like psychedelic, fabulous, ecstatic adventures. Um, yeah, and then, um, I don't know, that continued in some of the work in the, so this new book that's in the bottom corner, The Little yeah. Stranger, is it's, one, it's a new book of old stuff um, where it's all these little tidbits, but in the middle of it is a chunk of comics that kind of star this like comics version of myself mm -hmm. uh, getting into situations, and that was that was kind of evolved from the same place as Gaylord, but um, I think like Gaylord also involves this kind of like poetic language that came very much with a fantasy world. Um, and I think there's there's some parts of it where I was like, oh, I'm like just like writing a, <laughs> I'm writing a poem, like to keep it, to make a fantasy comic that also feels true to experience. It feels like it need, the world needs its own language, but also that can be, it can be limiting. That is to say that in Little Stranger, I started drawing myself so I could have like fake autobio comics that could get nastier, I think. <laughs> or yeah. earlier. I know we were talking before about like the limiting how autobio can be really limiting and like just also about once you try to pen an experience in any way you're kind of like really like solidifying it in one expression you know and that I can see why like Gaylor Phoenix you can't really actually lock a lot of this ephemeral kind of like emotive states into like this is how it is this is what it feels like to for this or that when so much of like deeper exchanges with people are so heavily nuanced yeah it would be overly simplistic to be like i just to give it like a base uh environment of like confusion or something or you know i mean i think that there's something about finding an evolving language mm -hmm. that happens in it too because I, I think that the language around like queer issues um, and trans issues and um, explicitly like trying to deal in kind of like non-binary spaces like there's not exactly a defined like I feel like I've come up against a wall when talking about my own sexuality or sexual experience where I'm like well it was like that but like the words I have to use for it feel empty and make the experience of it kind of fall apart. And so I think visually part of the comics is like looking for a way to express that language. Um, and yeah, I don't know, could we pull up an image yeah. from the Gaylord comics? Sorry, this, we're gonna walk through that really quick. We'll yeah, go back yeah, to yeah. Manning Palaces in a moment. Um, so this was actually the cover to the left is from the compendium of all the Gaylord things. Yes, that's the cover of the book that collects the first six issues of the comic, and then also put out by uh, Secret Acres. Yes, yes. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the, the drawings from it really evolved. There's a lot of bursting forts and whatnot, but I think um, the kind of visual language of Gaylord Phoenix was sort of evolved at, at, for being at a lack of words for trans experience and kind of having this like a more like uh, unusual like macaroni genitalia to like more more things like getting at what is how you feel as a person what's inside your brain um how do you move through space is a huge driving force in in the Gaylord comics yeah just even with this like having to hold hands underneath the surface yeah just even like something as simple as that to me, like, I don't know, resonates. I particularly love this image. Yeah, and like, um, like how do you, 
how you talk about trans sexual experience was it was huge for me um, for a while, like, and still is, frankly. Like, I and I think that a lot of you know, like the Gaylord book, if you're reading it for words, it takes about five minutes. Um, but hopefully, a lot gets conveyed in the drawings that take a bit longer to um, experience. Because uh, I think a lot of the link, like a lot of making comments for me was that visuals can do things that words can't yet, or the words aren't found. I mean, even things as basic, like I was talking with someone the other day that like, you know, a decade ago having conversations about gender neutral pronouns with the expectation that it was going to just be an insular thing and just about like respect within a stroke, like, small communities and like so the fact that that is more commonplace now that people will like start a conversation by saying their pronouns is huge like i'm just right. like oh that's like huge you know like and as much as the disaster as the world is i'm like oh okay there's like also like a small there's there's small openings getting wider yeah just even with gender neutral bathrooms absolutely like, like that's such a huge thing like we're like i've just noticed like from working in museums and other institutions that almost all the bathrooms now are gender neutral yeah you know where there is a gender neutral facility available um and so yeah the pronouns just in general i've noticed like throughout our, our friendship and also having published you like people will come to the table with all sorts of pronouns yeah and just kind of like trying to help navigate it towards without like you know being like excuse me you got it wrong but being like oh he, you know, yeah, yes, you like his work, like, you know, oh, maybe you knew Edie in Chicago, so this is why you're using the pronoun she. Yeah, um, and also, I mean, I think it is something that, um, I don't, for my own gender, like, and also, like, I've used, like, male pronouns for over a decade, but yeah. at the same time, like, uh, my trans masculinity comes with a lot of processing about ways ways to work with my identity that don't, like, that feel like they, like, aren't, um, disavowing, uh, being raised female or, like, you know, like, not kind of disrespecting those parts of myself. Um, and so, like, I've been very casual about pronouns in terms of, like, being like, no, it's, <laughs> you know, like, I'm like, I actually, like, I don't, I can't deny, like, some, some she in there, you know, and that is just part of the paradoxes of trans experience, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and something why uh, it's worth making comic after comic about me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I think not only is it like cathartic, like as a reader, like I was saying earlier when we met up, like I reread the actually the, the Gaylord Phoenix number seven that perfectly acceptable did and then i did number eight and i just reread them because i was like oh it's been a minute and you know i had a concussion in between so maybe i need to do a little refresher and i was just laying in bed like with tears in my eyes like i was just like this is like these pages which are from uh the perfectly acceptable i mean i'm just like uh speechless how, uh, yes, and also with our publication we did, just the playfulness in which it's these topics are addressed. I think what we were talking about is like a, it just it like a cosmic uh, cosmic erogenous comic artist. <laughs> is how it might best put uh, your your vibe. And I mean in general, like the tenderness in which. This, the, there's not a lot of language in the books, but the language that is used is very like playful and tender and conveys so much through its simplicity to me, um, which it's probably the only poetry that I like, to be honest. <laughs> I have a hard time with most poetry, but there's it's great poetry out there. But it's true. Thank but, you very much. Yes. Um, yeah, I think. Uh, I don't know, the return to the Gaylord series. So I drew Gaylord for a decade, but I draw I draw comics very slow, um, which uh, I would put out like one a year because that's just what I could manage. Which also, is like, still a lot. Pay the rent, you know? Um, 
Yeah, and so I feel like for a long time I just would put out one issue of Baylor a year, and then I did six issues like that, and they got reflected into a book, and I was like, oh, that's a good closing point for this character. And then, um, I don't know, it, it, it was starting to develop this format where, like, Gaylor goes on an adventure, he has some sex, he, like, deals with trauma, some transformation happens. And I was like, ooh, it's getting, like, a formula, and, like, I don't need to, like, keep drawing the same comic for the rest of my life. Little did I know that every comic I draw would be the same comic for the rest of my life. But um, the situations change, and, like, I feel like with the... Um, the uh, election of Trump, like, look, there was just, like, so much damp, like, it's just, it still is, like, it's a fractured and kind of terrible time, um, and it felt like a time to kind of return to the world of Gaylord and, and use that for dealing with some feelings, some community feelings, and, like, this kind of new edge of um, a multi-disaster. Yeah, it's referred to as a storm. Yeah, which I really appreciate. Like, if you, in the context of a political U.S. political climate and also worldwide climate, but we'll just focus on the U.S. right now. Like, addressing kind of like the very outright attacks towards queer, transgender, uh, basically anybody who doesn't fit within the uh, a straight binary kind of mentality has been very much under attack, and so. The using as instead of it being very explicitly political, where it's like Trump got elected, they're trying to you know kick out uh, transgender military personnel, et cetera. It's like there's a storm that's happening. This very like earth shattering. Like there, I know in um, this particular one uh, issue seven, just like it being represented as like wild kind of like zigzaggy explosive. Like, this is yeah, the environment that is coming to... And I mean, I think it's like, you know, it's... it's Because uh, it is something that we're facing that is, like, political and energy and machinery um, and also, like, environmental collapse. Yeah. And, like... Um, and I'm not the most articulate at conveying political ideas in a way that doesn't maybe come off as didactic, like, when mm -hmm. I write about them. Um, so I'm much more interested in like political conversations with friends. But then when it comes to making comics, I'm like, oh, that can't not be in the work. But then like, how does this kind of fantasy world I've been working for so long, um, how does that handle this? You know, because it can't not. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it really is a fantasy land. All yeah. of the environments of uh, the our Gaylord Phoenix travels through are just so like, uh, I mean, there's, I don't even, I don't even know where to start. There's the, these webs, there's wizards, there's uh, like just this geometric person that they're walking through. That's one of the characters, you know, it's like, I just love that um, in the, you, there's so many ways this could have been done, and it could have, you could have tried to go a representational route, but to me, I think it would have really fallen flat. And that this is, to me, just way more beautiful and nuanced, I would say. Oh, thank you. And I also love Paisley, especially there's some Paisleys in there. I think there, I mean, like, there's usually some nerdy nature fact that kind of drives the visual look of each or like a, a design element that I become really um, obsessed with that kind of drives the visual look of each of the Gaylord comics which really do I mean like I started the first one was drawn with like ballpoint pen on copy paper and like these ones are just kind of a step above you know like I switched to maybe a nicer pen on a Bristol board or something uh -huh. but, the drawings for them are very simple, but they're all kind of fixated on, like, I think the issue that you published, which turned out beautifully, I think, thank you so much, um, was, like, very heavily based on, like, uh, spores, and, like, mm -hmm. kind of like a world of, like, a, a very, like, spore, spore-dispersed world, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, 
Oh, yeah, the connections are like mycelium and community, and which the book also re refers to like healing through a community and just not it being a solo act. Yeah, and I think for, and you know, in terms of like non comic books to read, uh, the book Mycelium Running. Oh, yeah. Paul Simmons. <laughs> Paul Simmons, like, uh, we're fun little dorks over here. Yeah, and um, most recently, like, The Mushroom at the End of the World. Did you read that? No, I need it somewhere. It's song. very good. Um, but a lot of the, like, part of what those books talk about mushrooms doing is the way that kind of the mycelial network works, where kind of nutrients can get sent where they're needed and things can blossom um, when they need to, like in a certain, like the idea of like a community rather than a canon, I think, mm -hmm. is what uh, mushroom networks are sort of, um, but like what they kind of represent is yeah. this like. It's also very decentralized. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's very, it's, it seems very generous and very decentralized. Yeah, exactly. Um, going back, sorry, I'm going to skip back through these, um, and we're going to go to memory policies because you mentioned ballpoint pens. Yes. And wasn't ball, the ballpoint pen a big part of memory policies in the beginning? Yeah. And I think, I mean, like I was, um, I was nomadic and traveling for a long time or like if I wasn't nomadic, I was, um, you know, moving like every four months, basically, whether that was in town or like from city to city. Um, and so I think ballpoint pens are like one of the easiest things to like yeah. consistently have in my life. And also the start of the drawings, which I think, I mean, I feel like that I've always had kind of a, maybe like a more fine arts practice adjacent to my comics work, but the memory palaces drawings were sort of the, the kickoff of the paintings I'm doing now. And it was based around like, I mean, I think that, uh, what a rich tool the ballpoint pen, like. I know, overlooked. Overlooked, yeah. overlooked. Um, but I had been drawing leather and I kind of got to this like trans, oh, trans yeah. like point where like if you're filling in a whole piece of paper with like designs in ballpoint pen, it really, it, first of all, it, it'll ruin your wrist if you do it too long. So handle with care. But it also like, it was, I think it was the first real point where I like hit a drawing and I was like, oh, there's, um, there, this is like a texture that gives me a way of thinking about a drawing and also a way to kind of almost like trance out and float along, along with it. So it, it was really like instrumental in shaping like how, um, how this drawing series worked, which Although it's not comics, I felt like it ended up being this like expanding neighborhood that was based on real and imagined gay history in Chicago. Yeah, um, this is very interesting actually about how memory palaces came about. I I was just saying earlier this morning that I was even I uh, didn't totally understand the depths of this project until I read more interviews, but it was based off of kind of coming across at Quimby's a publication called Closed Dick. Close Dick Magazine. Yeah. And uh, then going from there and looking at the ads for old, like, gay bars, et cetera, and reimagining them in a new potential yeah. architecture and going to the places where they these clubs had been or these establishments and um, kind of reimagining them in these more fantastical and like almost like a potential for a future rather than like commemorate, like rather than mourning the past, like, oh, it's over, it's done, it's gone, like more of a commemorative and inspirational. Absolutely. Because I think that, I mean, there's something about the, there's something when I landed back in Chicago, I was like, oh, this like, the ground almost felt like it was vibrating with kind of the history of a, a like queer place there um but I, it was also something i couldn't quite put my finger on until i started finding like these old gay bar ads and things and i'd go to the site of where they were and it would just be like super boring <laughs> right it would just be like and a map a map of store and kind of strip mall yeah. like just like you know but the ads would get me like really excited i'd be like right there have always been these spaces da 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 and so the series was much more about like um, well, I'm sure the snake pit was actually a lot of fun. I'm sure Even it was. if it, you know, it's like a mattress store now. And yes. It's boring. Yes. More of like capturing the energy potential that was inside. Yeah. Rather than the actual architecture. And the potential of that, like, um, 
of the idea of that space for for right now like mm-hmm. rather than just having it be like a nostalgia trip or something like um jane was actually it wasn't a queer space it was an uh, underground abortion right. service that ran in Chicago. Um, and that was like completely like covert. It was like people making a phone call, showing up a place, being driven to like two other places right. to, um, to have an abortion performed. And in the 70s. In the 70s yeah. in Chicago, it was yeah. still illegal. And um, yeah, so that was part of the idea for making a facade for Jane to, that was like the most like outward, fabulous. Yeah, which overly laden thing <laughs> yeah. which i was like just like oh like this place is like that radical history really needs it needs a it needs its own like monument <laughs> yes yeah um so there's a lot of like um and this was kind of where I, the idea of like ecstatic architecture telling a story and telling like a queer story developed in my work and it's gone a lot of places like it, it's I've used it to kind of deal, grapple with like queer issues and using architecture forms to talk about kind of paradoxical or impossible things that feel like impossible to build within queer community and yet totally impossible and yet totally necessary mm-hmm. connected. Um, so like working in the realm of like of ever more ecstatic architecture is kind of where I head with the meetings. But also, I was I was reading something that was talking about how your work is like in similar to a lot of like uh, and I believe you're in a show coming up. It was HIV and AIDS artists of the '80s doing more abstract work to convey like more complex topics and conversations that otherwise at the time would have just been like dismissed, you know, because of such like a heavy time and it was just so easy for everybody to dismiss like people struggling with HIV names is just like go away basically and so it was it had to become like kind of abstract in order for it to enter the canon basically well i also think it's like a issue of multiple fronts like you have work that very directly addresses an issue and i feel like there's work that's very like representational like with right. like coming out of trans communities that's very powerful right um and I feel like I'm much more on the like the dreamer and like the dreams right. end of the spectrum where I'm like it's also important to like visualize to like have kind of like to visualize potentials in different ways. Right. And I think that's part of abstraction totally. is um, where it's a much more subtle thing. Like I sometimes I look at my work and I'm like, oh, I'm like super sport. Like nobody's you know I I do a drawing of a building of a building and I'm like, oh, it's about gender. And people are like, really? <laughs> but um, well, I'm gonna fast forward really quick. Apologies about this, but um, we, get we looked at Little Stranger. No, we did not. How, we how are we for time? Uh, we're getting okay. there, but uh, I was actually jumping to your paintings because this ties into that about the abstraction and there being like I think that the titles themselves really inform the work. Yeah, a lot in a way we're like just left on its own you know, without a context like it's totally to me a beautiful image that you can interpret a lot from it but the title definitely informs yeah what's going on and i think all the titles for the more that these are all gouache and ink on panel on the panel yeah yeah that that just ties also in with the memory palaces of just this kind of like abstraction but deeper meanings. Yeah, and, and I think I'm really interested in getting to a truth of feeling and a truth of experience that I can't get to necessarily with just words alone. Um, and uh, yeah, I, uh, I don't know, it, it's definitely like come around from being very much about these reimagining these buildings to using this kind of architectural language to talk about the body and the trans experience. Mm-hmm. Um, like the the tea room, I wanted to do a really convoluted, ornate building that was about my like con- convoluted, innate, or not innate, uh, convoluted, 
yet intricate relationship with like uh, testosterone, mm -hmm. taking testosterone, which has happened at a, a couple points in my life and, and currently, but uh, wasn't. It, I don't know. I have a, a lot to say about it, but some of it gets conveyed in this strange structure that came out of it. Yeah, I mean, I think sometimes it's it takes like an inf someone who's informed to pull more that yeah. of that information from it. You have to know that you're transgender. You have to know about taking testosterone, etc. But still. Um, as someone who is informed, I'm like, oh yeah, you can see that just all these details of like turning it like F to M and the different uh, squares. Ways both the like more publication based work and then the fine art like really resonates with everybody I know within kind of queer world because there's like oh finally someone's making work you know and it's very public and it's being very acknowledged like and well way. there's a lot of people making work yes um i guess i i think what what i feel myself to be part of is part of like kind of this like maybe a, a trans imaginary or something mm -hmm. um where it's uh kind of work that it is not as maybe direct as some of the work that's coming out, but that gets to like a state of being and talks about a state of being and and adds to that um, the pool of the pool of what we have for that, mm -hmm. which is small and ever growing. <laughs> <laughs> um, we should talk about Little Stranger just for a moment and then maybe open up for questions. But um, I think in general, I already talked to you about this, but like the reviews where people like either, like I was saying that I, you know, in my research about him that I came across, uh, you know, everything's listed on Amazon now. And I, as a like sideboard hobby, I will read Amazon reviews because sometimes they're just totally off the hook. But uh, I realized that because uh, in an interview I read, read uh, with Edie, that was done with Edie, someone was asking about, maybe it was Gaylord Phoenix, and you were saying that like people, a lot of the reviews were like noting like, oh, this book isn't for everyone, which is like kind of what book is for everyone, right? You know, and you say that and you're like, yeah, what is, what's the deal? Not I mean, I think that's like, it's like a roundabout or like a, like a sidewards way of being like it's about trans stuff yeah and you it's might, a lazy way to talk about a book because everybody might be knows. uncomfortable or something like, right it's, it's a similar like from being in bands and you know oftentimes it's like there's a lady in the band and it's like who cares at this point you right know? it's a way <laughs> when you put that kind of preface with it it means that there's it's not a part of some kind of normative structure which you know of the look binary. out yeah yeah so I just thought that these two reviews, sorry again for bouncing back through this, uh, Little Stranger, Secret Acres put this out, the compendium of all sorts of greatness. Yeah, so Little Stranger collects like comics and zines from the past decade pretty much, and it's a real, um, I, there's definitely like through lines that run through it, but it collects like a bunch of zines that I've put out but that are now out of print some hard to find like drawings and other material um and uh yeah a lot of like standalone comics kind of the center of the book is after I finished the first kind of segment of Gaylord again like I started drawing myself in comics mm -hmm. and trying to figure out um so that's me peeping through that fence up there which <laughs> I love this one um and uh yeah, I don't know, working working in kind of a new sort of fantastic world that uh, that also I was I was part of very much. Because that was something where I, when I finished Gaylord, everyone was like, oh, are you the Gaylord Phoenix? Are you right, this character? Right. And I was like, well, sure, yes, of course, but right. also not. Yeah. Um, but just to make it blatant, like who's who in the comics. Right, that, which is more like this is you. Yeah, that's yeah. me. And like... Um, yeah, I don't know. And then and then also like with um 
with these comics, uh, I guess it was also about taking more like, uh, I guess like a humanoid trans body, Mm -hmm. my body, and putting it in these spaces also to be blatant about like what was going on with that. Mm -hmm. Not like in this one, these panels are not uh, sequential. Actually, there's a panel in between, just to be clear about that. Um, I know one thing I also read was like, and I just know this in general, like people get all bothered if there's no actual panels. You right. know, like if you start doing anything that doesn't involve panels, right. you're like, what is this? Or non, more non-narrative kind of things. People are like, I don't understand. Like it needs to be really, you know, paneled out, very clear. This happened, this happened. And, you know, like this is the kind of thing that might drive someone nuts. Right. Even though I love this. <laughs> but one of the reviews, which I just thought, there's two reviews for Little Stranger on Amazon, just to say. And to me, they just, it really encompasses the two mentalities, not to keep it within another binary. But one of them, the two star, two star by Carl, he says, I was expecting a story that had, has a plot line for the whole book. I didn't understand it one bit. If you're into deep thoughts and weird stories, then this could be for you. So that's the one camp. Then the other camp is five star from a quote, jaded bastard. Picture Fly Orr doing an enlightened Mike Diana, heartily infused with Gayan Wilson's sensibilities, yet gender fucked in the greatest possible way. Seth DeBachman does the Folsom Street Fair on ketamine. Picture the storyboards for Derek Jarman's film, a Pasolini's interpretations of the kinkier possibilities of the Lovecraft myth- mythos. And I'm like, okay, there, you know, it's like really like kind of like the two camps. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and like, I mean, you know, I, I, uh, I appreciate Carl giving it a try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, for sure, for sure. Um, and I think I don't, you know, like I don't make work that I, I want necessarily to be like preaching to the choir, right. but I also feel like there's a lot of work to do uh within the choir (laughs) too to like talk about things and learn to talk about things and to learn how to build a world we want and i think that that is maybe um you know like my primary concern is like building a world i want with other people like yourself um back at you and uh you know like it interpreting it for the norms is not work that I'm uh great at <laughs> it's not your job and also. it's not it doesn't enrich the comics I make it, it at, at all when I've tried to I'm like oh like I'll maybe I should spell this out more but I feel like there's a power to um capturing how I fe- I feel yeah <laughs> and like getting that exactly. experience it's getting authentic. that experience right um so yeah, no, despite the fact that it's legitimate work to like take Carl to that place, like I, I don't think I can. Carl can do his own work to get to that place. Yeah, yeah, which yeah, is, yeah. you know. The cave where Jade Bastard and I live. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, I don't know, it's, it's interesting though. It, I've definitely gotten that response where people will like flip through something at a table and be like, oh, I just don't, I, I don't get your work at all. Yeah. Um, and whether or not it's like panels that freak them out um, or no panels Um, or any type of sexuality at all like I definitely from tabling people are like okay out of here and you're like what's I mean you know we we all have private parts you know people are having sex out there in the world (laughs) <laughs> you know, just saying they are. Believe it or not. Yeah, believe it or not, people are having feelings and, you know, et cetera. And I, I do appreciate that, um, you know, in this day and age, that that's becoming more okay with speaking about publicly, like, you know, here today. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of which, we should uh, start doing a little Q&A. Like, if oh, sure, people yeah. have any questions, just because it's already one. Um, people have questions for Edie, just feel free. Yeah. I apologize if this was answered earlier, but in and out, but um, uh, you mentioned, you, you were just talking about like mentioning uh, uh, finishing the OST and actually moving on to other things. But since the book came out, you've also done, I think, two. Yeah. Uh, the OST with Carolyn, is 
Yeah, well, one yeah. with Caroline and um, uh, one with um, Perfectly yeah. Acceptable in Chicago. Yeah. Now I do. Yeah, when I first finished the collection, I was like, close the book on that one. Like, it had gotten to the point, I think I said this a little earlier, where it was, I had written like a seventh one after the book came out, and it just felt like I was making the same comic. Um, but I feel like, yeah, as I, I, I think we touched it a little earlier, like, kind of with um, the political situation we find ourselves in, and the world, I think, has changed a lot since the, the Gaylord book came out, and the fantasy world that he's in now is reflecting that. And that's kind of what drew me back into those comics, which, um, I don't know, I, I kind of, uh, I draw a new one when time permits, but also when kind of I'm overwhelmed by the idea for a story for one. So that feels very innate to me. Like I've never been able to force a Gaylord comic out. It's always kind of uh, like hit, hit me like the memory of a dream or something. I'm like, oh, I've, I've got to run with that idea and see where it goes. So there should be a, um, I think there's gonna be a couple more at least, um, but probably next year, not this year. Uh, any other questions? Yes? Uh, I was curious about the paintings. Like, oh, yeah. You said you work with, you mostly work with uh, ink and paper. But how are these made? Oh, yeah. So even the ink and paper ones, um, the color is done with gouache and calligraphy ink. Um, and then these ones are gouache, gouache and ink on wood panel and um, also uh, a little like airbrush acrylic calligraphy ink as well. So, um, yeah, this painting. Oh, they're like, um, they're anywhere from like this big to like that big. So fairly small. Yeah. Was there another question? My question was about the size. Oh, yeah, okay, great, great, great. Yeah, um, they are, uh, they're pretty small. Um, I have a couple of opportunities in the fall to work on mural size projects. Oh, wow. So uh, we'll see how it translates to very big from being pretty small. <laughs> you're gonna have to like but more like time limits for yourself for detailing oh yeah <laughs> like actual architecture scale rather than like fantasy like tunnel vision world yeah yeah any other questions yes Oh yeah. Um, well, for um, I usually start with like I, I take notes in the world of just like things I like or like take quick photos of like ornamentation that speaks to me in some way. Especially if it's something that I can't like stop looking at or thinking about. Like I'll make a note of um, the pattern or element or weird science fact or whatever that it is that I'm thinking about. And then when I start a project it is usually trying to make sense of kind of a, um, not a word salad, but a thought salad, where I'm like, oh, like, um, I have a painting that I don't think is in the slideshow that's called Fitting Room, and it is based on kind of like a infinite, like those like folding mirrors for looking at clothes of yourself, and I had just like gone through some like bodily changes where I was like, oh gosh, it's like the kind of thing where you feel like none of your clothes fit right, but it's also like you, I was like, oh, none of, feels like I'm going through this like weird identity shift in terms of like gender and, and queer stuff. Um, and, but it also felt like the idea of like mirrors that replicated themselves. I was like, oh, it's like a never ending like hall of mirrors kind of thing. Um, and then at the same time, like I was around the corner from uh, my studio is around the corner from this really beautiful psychic hand painted sign for a psychic that had like all these different like each of the letters was made out of like this weird mix of colors that I thought was very beautiful like um and super unusual and I couldn't stop thinking about those colors so I was like oh th these colors are like the weird frame for these mirrors it's like a it's kind of like um having a lot of ingredients in the kitchen and being like, oh God, like I gotta eat something. <laughs> like what nourishes and like what goes together well and um, finding where 
finding how graphic language fits into ideas, I think, is the important thing for me. Um, and it doesn't always work, but I think sometimes when it does, it really vibrates in my mind. And I like, you know, I've done a few paintings in my life where they, I've, I've finished them when they start vibrating at me in this way, like a visual vibration, and I'm like, oh, that is like, I, I don't know if it'll say something to the world, but it says something to me, and that is like, that that's the best part. <laughs> I feel like I read somewhere that oftentimes with the more printed work that you'll do kind of like the panel that means that has the core idea and then work from there. So it's not just starting with the beginning and building up, but like just whatever, oops, like getting the essence. Yeah. Which if, I think is very interesting because most people like are storyboarding and it's oh this to this and but really, that's like, almost like when I read that, I was like, oh, it makes so much sense. <laughs> yeah. You know? But like, because it isn't like a straight through. Yeah. And like, I have a, um, yeah, definitely. If I'm doing a comic and it's based around like a, like something that I know has to be an image in it, I'll draw that first. And then um, the rest of the story kind of makes itself fit around that, whether that's like the last panel or like slap in the middle or like the very first the very first one I've got. Uh, any last uh, last question? So we should probably wrap this up. Thank, all right. Thank yeah. you all for coming. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you so much to you, Karen. Thank you for being here. <laughs>